Hello, I'm Pedro Mora with Pacific Media, and now Pauline. One of the keynote speakers at the Dystopia Forum at the University of Victoria recently was Professor Lauren Landman from Loyola University. He presents an analysis of our current cultural hegemony and also his perspective of the Occupy movement. That I want to argue that the Occupy movement is an emotion driven. When I say emotion driven, it means that outside some academic perspectives, especially social movement theory, people have feelings. They get happy, they get sad, and when they lose their jobs, they lose their dignity, and they lose their self esteem. So it's and to say that it's emotion driven does not mean that it's irrational, that early social movement theory basically said it's the irrational mobs. The reason they were irrational is they were opposing domination, but that's a whole other story. Okay, so Occupy is what I will argue an emotion-driven counter-hegemonic movement to transform society, but to do so by changing the discourses of identity, meaning, and values. Okay, the summary parts. Neoliberalism sucks. I think most people know that. It leads to greater and greater inequality. It leads to various e legitimacy crises. This is the Habermas motion I'll come to later. And what do, they pe what do people do when they have these kinds of feelings? They either establish or they get into existing social networks, which are increasingly real or, or alternatives. Occupy, I will argue, is an expression of hope rooted in the transformations of identity and political economy. And it has a utopian vision that I would argue has been around for a long time, but very clearly seen in the Paris Commune and in the global justice movements. But what I want to suggest is that, economic, that neoliberalism, and most of what I have to say is ripped off from Harvey, uh, really consists of two things. It's a hegemonic ideology that justifies you know, an unregulated market, let the capitalists, the global capitalists, skew everyone. But the other part of you know, that gets tied into it. The other part of the dominant ideology it, that it maintains the society, the, the global society, is consumerism. Uh, those of us that are familiar with the work of, if not personally, Leslie Sclair, know that that's one of the most important points that he makes, that it's the idea, not, you know, neoliberalism promises us we're going to get more and more money, Bullshit. but it also promises us with that money, we're going to buy new and better and bigger things and we're going to see how all, all that a ended up. But anyhow, the results of neoliberalism we've seen have been greater inequality, and increasingly much of that inequality is based on ever more screwing over the poor, what Harvey calls accumulation through dispossession. Okay, to borrow the title from Rick Wolf, the capitalism has hit the fat. Uh, the first time, when I read uh, Saskia's first edition of the, of the Global City, and she mentioned there how much of the world commerce, this was like, what is it, 1991 or something that it came out? The, she mentioned how so much of the commerce consisted of you know, financial transactions shooting across the globe in the privately owned financial networks. Well, you know, that was 20-some years ago. The expansion of the financial sector ha has been amazing. When I try to explain this to my students and tell them about the derivatives market, it was worth, it crashed, and it's back to worth about $612 trillion. Now, if you think that's a lot of money, think of it this way. That's 12 times the, exi 12 times the GNP of the world. So how do you wind up with a value? It, it's... It's like monopoly money, except real people get screwed. It's all based on these fictional, these phantom kinds of, kinds of capital, based on these, you know, 30 to 1 leveraging of debt. For the people that know, they understand the collateralized mortgage obligations, I'm going to skip over that. What we wind up having is a legitimation crisis, and most of you people should hopefully recognize him. That's Jürgen Habermas. Um, the important point about a legitimation crisis, and this is where my Frankfurt School background, he's a Frankfurter, come in, that it just takes place at the level of the system and the individual. These are not two separate things, but these are closely uh, in intervolved. One of the points that Habermas makes, and he made it under a different context, is that in face of a system crisis, and these are the failures of the steering mechanisms, the controls of the society, they, they migrate to the level of motivation and identity. And that's what my main point is in terms of if you can't change, you know, to change the system, one of the things you've got to change is the identity and develop counter-hegemonic identities that challenge and question the system that we live in. 
the system has had a number of crises. I'm not going to go into this in detail, as I've said, uh, but the whole thing came tumbling down in 2002-8 when the housing market that created the artificial values, the values of selling mortgages and use turning mortgages. This is the sorcerer's apprentice. You know, you wave a magic wand and you turn debt into asset. It, it's a wonderful thing. It's a con game. It's a casino. It's, it's casino capitalism. But anyhow, the whole thing would have held up if housing values kept going on and on forever. And if you keep doubling the price of housing every other year and you keep salaries flat, the, as I said before, capitalism or the shit's going to hit the fan. And so it did, especially when we had a failure of regulation. Okay, so we can start out with the political system. Uh, and I'm talking about the level of the system. And we talked about, you know, the financialization of the system and the move to casino capitalism, which is gambling. The derivatives market is like betting on what the temperature is going to be next July 18th. You know, if you pick it out right, you make a fortune. If not, you lose usually somebody else's money. The function of the state, and I know a number of people in globalization don't believe states matters anymore, such as, for example, Leslie Sclair, they're considered. States are absolutely necessary to regulate the, supposedly regulate the rules of capital and to uh, basically suppress dissent when and where it, where it happens because um, a lot of people don't like what's happening. There is a problem, though, with the state in terms of how it manages crisis. If it wants to maintain its legitimacy, it has to be able to allocate funds to do it. In other words, schools, hospitals, roads, uh, some kind of social programs, etc. But neoliberalism says all these things are bad. Uh, so as the state withdraws, it loses its legitimacy at the same time. And we can see what's happened because of the cutbacks and the retrenchments in various things that have gone on. Finally, an essential aspect that maintains the system, as I mentioned before, is hegemony. And here we have three or four hours worth of discussion on Gramsci, uh, which I will avoid. But to simply say that hegemony consists of a set of values that make what's historically arbitrary seem normal, natural, and every day. And it basically makes the interests of the ruling class seem as if they benefit everyone, which is why we have so much support for the, or up until recently, the neoliberalism which, of course, does not work. Now, as I said before, for the financial elite, neoliberalism is a religion. It's sometimes called market fundamentalism. But most people understand that the goods life, that is accumulating more and more material things, is the best thing you can, you can have. And trying to convince people that consumption is not the way to go is pretty difficult, you know, even when you tell them our mode of consumption is going to destroy the planet in about 100 years. Okay, point number two. With economic crisis, we get emotional responses. People become angry, upset, uh, you know, frustrated. Their self-esteem becomes shattered, especially since work becomes such a very important thing. Uh, one of, uh, you know, one of the sociologists that does social movements, a guy named Jim Jasper, talks about moral shock. Anyhow, people get these powerful emotional responses. It is at this point where our theories, our social movement theories, should be helpful, but for the most part, they're not. What I want to argue, then, is that to understand these movements, we have to understand that these are not classical interest-driven driven movements. These are not class-based in terms of wages and benefits. It's a movement that wants to transform society and do it through the transformation of, of identity that this is a hybrid identity that comes out of economic crisis, but it's also a critique of the way we live, the modes of living. And as I said before, this goes back a long ways. One of the places we can trace it is to the Port Huron statement. Okay, so ultimately from these emotions, what we want to do is how do we, how do we handle them? How do we take our anger and do something besides kill someone or hit our heads against the wall? We get organized. We get into social networks. Some people form them. Some people lead them. Some people join them. Some people find them. But it's very important that these social networks are necessary. Uh, it's a whole lengthy discussion on the networks that enabled Occupy, but that's a, another story. One of the main principles of what, the, what comes out of Europe, new, new social movement theory coming out of the tradition of Alain Turan, uh, Manuel Castells, uh, Alberto Malucci, is that these new social movements aim at the transformation of culture, meaning, and identity. They operate in the public sphere, not in the political sphere. 
And so these occupations, and criti these occupations exist as critiques of the dominant system and portray alternatives, especially the emphasis on horizontalism, participatory democracy, the mic check that was mentioned before. Uh, these tactics, however, did, were very effective, except uh, in terms of changing the discussions in the United States from austerity to jobs, focusing on the greed of Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what's important is a lot of people say, there's no program, there's no agenda, there's no demands. There's very good reasons for that because to, uh, you know, to emphasize supporting a, a, a liberal Democrat is to support a completely corrupted two-party system. So the ultimate point that I want to come to is that these movements are trying to transform identity to give people a sense of meaning, a sense of empowerment, to live a life based on sharing, caring, and living in harmony with nature. These movements involve hope. I have lengthy discussions on hope, which I would hope to give at another time since I'm running out of time now. And I think that this is really important uh, because when you talk about hope as I do, this shades into utopian visions. Uh, and I think what I want to just briefly mention is that at this point my work very much depends on one of the great Frankfurt School theorists, Ernst Bloch, who wrote a three volume uh, notion on the principles of hope in which coming off of Freud's notion of dreams as wish fulfillments, he talks about how this is an inherent part of human life, the wish for the better life, and I would go so far as to say there's a very strong utopian element that too often has been promised to us by religion, which is the good news, the bad news is it in the next life. And, you know, I'm not that anxious to get to the next life. I mean, I think there is one, but I think that we have to establish it here. Insofar as the crisis of neoliberalism will endure, so too will pressures from the left and various progressive mobilizations, and Occupy plays a special role. But before we can become too sanguine, let's remember that the same economic stresses can also foster mobilization on the right, as, was the scene, as is the scene in Europe today. And let's not forget what happened to Europe in the 1930s. Occupiers, we wish you well. Thank you.